The first thing I, I would like to share with you is that 50 years ago, I was sitting kind of where you are. Not exactly, I was in the School of Education because there was nothing like IMC. I am amazed and impressed that integrated marketing communications has been developed and it's relatively new. Do you all have any idea how new it is? I don't know how much information you get like from the intro to IMC. What, what's your image of how many? Hey, you've got total recall. I'm impressed. I'll tell Professor Feeney <laughs> that he's, you're remembering his words. It is so impressive to me. First time I got exposed to IMC in 2012 when I was invited to come back and speak on a panel with Harold Burson and Mickey Brazell. And Harold Burson is the godfather, the grandfather, the founder of public relations PR, Burson Marsteller is the most prominent international uh, PR firm. And he's very much associated with the school. He's a graduate of Ole Miss. And where I was, when I was in uh, Ole Miss 50 years ago, I, there weren't that many options open. So what a message I got in my ear for most young Southern women was if you want to go to college and you hear that if you want to go to college, I hope that message is very different today than being a teacher is just one of the greatest professions you could have because you will have something to fall back on if something happens to your husband. Now I hope that message has changed today too. So I got a degree in education with a major in English, and I was re ready to teach high school English in Oxford High School in the fall of uh, 1968. I was marrying my college boyfriend, because that's just kind of what you did. <coughs> well, I canceled everything. I didn't get married to that man, uh, and it's nothing wrong with him. It was just the script that I realized was written by somebody, not me, for somebody, not me. So I was very lucky that I had an opportunity, I had a connection. Networking is key. People you know, that's another key. Ask me, how would you like to come to work for Procter & Gamble? And I don't mind saying, it might have been embarrassing at the time, but it was understandable. I had a degree in English and was going to teach high school English and I said to her what is Procter & Gamble and she said why don't you go in your laundry room and your bathroom and you look at all those brands most of them are made by Procter & Gamble and she said I would like to set up an interview for you in market research and I said well what is that she explained to me so I was very lucky that I sort of stumbled in to this career. So I worked for Procter & Gamble for three years and I was trained in consumer market research. And it, there are two types and what I really appreciate, uh, many things I appreciate about Professor Dr. Brody and um, Bodhi and you're very uh, lucky to have him as a professor um, he's renamed what the corporate world calls qualitative and quantitative, the two big categories of consumer research. He's named them in a far more descriptive way that the qualitative is narrative. You let people talk, you have a conversation with people and it's one-on-one -on -one, and it's more personal and it's a narrative. And the quantitative is all about numbers, so it's numerical. And I really appreciate the, the new language to talk about these two major categories that have existed uh, as long as there have been companies and products and services to communicate. It's all about understanding your target audience. 
So I was trained in both quantitative numerical and qualitative uh, narrative. And then I went to work for, when I was tired, I traveled the continental US, I would get a telegram every Thursday. I love to say to my great nieces and nephews, well, back in the last century, on Thursdays I'd get a telegram. They say, oh, Aunt Leslie, what's a telegram? <laughs> So that was the way we got our assignments because we travel the continental US monitoring test markets and conducting research about the brands that Procter & Gamble made, what they were test marketing, or if they had new advertising that was being tested. So we traveled the continental US and we'd get an, a, a directive every Thursday to tell us which city to go to next. Well, after three years of living out of hotels and suitcases and not really having a real life established anywhere, I decided it was time to settle down and I joined a company, small but mighty, in Kansas City, Missouri, uh, New Product Insights, founded by Lou Berry, who had been director of market research for General Mills. He married a woman from Kansas City, so he came to Kansas City and he said what he noticed was really problematic in the world of the, the corporate giants and how they develop new ideas and new products and new packaging and new advertising campaigns. They depended on their advertising agencies. And the advertising agency really had only one idea and they want revenues from products that are being advertised. So they really didn't do a very good job of helping companies understand how to harness their assets and develop new product ideas that are going to be successful and eventually be global. So I spent three years with NPI and then um, I decided it was time to, be, thank you, be on my own, thank you very much. And I started my own company because by then I knew quite a number of key people in Fortune 500 companies. And for them to hire new product insights, they were spending half a million dollars or more on a very comprehensive project. Well, by then I had honed my skill in the narrative part of research talking to consumers and understanding how to ask questions, to have them tell me not what that public person wants you to hear and how they want you to feel about them, but even to read body language. You know, when people were coming into a, how many have ever been in a focus group? Has anybody ever seen a focus group? Okay, uh, does it, how many of you have some idea of what a focus group is? Okay, now did you cover it or is this, you just have, why, what did, who, who raised a hand and said you know what a focus group is? Well, we talked about it in our account planning class. Oh. And then also just television. Okay. Did anybody ever see Mad Men? I mean, that's more my era, but I, I knew about that and then that woman who did the focus groups really did focus groups. I mean, that was so realistic and so authentic, it was very cool. Let me talk about the narrative part of consumer research and, and there are really two major types. One is a focus group and a focus group is when you want to learn from a sampling of the target audience for whatever your client is, your product, your service, a political candidate. They use focus groups a lot. I never did focus groups for a political candidate. I refused because they manipulate what comes out from really from the consumer and that's not the way research is supposed to work. You're supposed to really learn, get into the heads, um, the heart and the soul of your target customer, 
learn what it is they want, and I hone my skill in being able to ask the right questions that is never leading. You never lead them. You really ask a question <coughs> because you really want to know the answer. You want to know what they want, but there are people who, and there are plenty of, uh, like those robocalls you get during some kind of campaign or some kind of election, and they'll say, say, did you know that John Brown uh, signed away? And but it's supposed to be a, a survey, but they sort of plant what they want you to hear, something negative about the other candidate. Um, the way it's supposed to work is a, a sampling of the target audience is uh, recruited, in this case recruited by national market research companies because they want to get people who just represent, let's say, female head of household uh, 18 to 24 or 25 to 34 in a certain age group. They use certain products. Um, it just it will fit a certain demographic and we did focus groups around the country so that we made sure we avoided any kind of geographical bias and the focus groups, people are recruited, they're screened to fit a profile, they're invited to come. Usually they're told two hours and they, they go to a location where there is a focus group set up and we're going to have one as soon as the new addition to the Meek School is built. I'm funding a state-of-the-art consumer research center and we're gonna have a focus group facility where the focus group is in one room, there's a wall separated by a viewing glass, and then and the other side are the observers, the clients, the observers, whoever they are. And everything is videotaped and audio taped and um, streamed live for clients who are scattered around the country. The other type of narrative is a, a called an individual interview or an IDI, in individual in-depth interview, in individual depth interview, IDIs. And that's when a focus group is very, it works when it's okay, you really want people to stimulate conversation. They're listening to each other and what one person says is just going to help create a thought in somebody else's mind, but there's always the potential that there's a bias that happens. And you have to be skilled in making sure that bias uh, is, you can't do like in a courtroom where it says uh, to the jury, strike that from the record, somebody has said something they shouldn't have. Well, those people heard it, excuse me. You know, maybe it's not gonna be in the recorded record, but it's been heard. So if you really need very clean, very unbiased information, then you choose the IDI, the individual in-depth interview, to talk to people individually. And I've done that uh, in a room, face-to-face, -face, or I've done it via video conferencing. That's very big. Uh, many times our cl clients are scattered all over, or um, I do teleconferencing. So, for example, when one of the Johnson & Johnson family of companies that makes a, a drug, a biologic for rheumatoid arthritis, and I needed to talk to rheumatologists, the doctors who prescribe it, and they work with rheumatoid arthritis patients, there aren't that many. They're about a hundred in all of the U.S. Their uh, rheumatologists are a very small segment of the doctor pool. So I would do teleconferencing. So I could be anywhere. I could link three doctors from across the country and I could be anywhere. The only disadvantage is that, yes, my clients could listen in, but it's not the same as seeing the live. A lot of it is reading body language. And that's part of the skill, too, of being a qualitative researcher, is you read, I, I always look to see where people, I've got a, a table and I've got chairs around it, and I always like to see who comes in first and where do they choose to sit. Because we don't assign seats. So they get their name cards, 
And I always look, whoever wants to, so I'm sitting here and I've got this table and I'm waiting to see the person who you know is going to try to dominate and talk the most. They're not inhibited. They're going to sit right here. They want to sit right next to the teacher. They want to be the first in and they always, they're the ones who've always got the hand up to, and you have to say, hey, I want to hear your opinion, but hold on to that and let me talk to Bob over here. And because you just, you don't want to turn somebody off, but you want other people to speak. What's important in a focus group, you have to involve everybody. So I always tell everybody at the very beginning, so I tell them, who I am, why I'm there, why they've been invited to come. Usually we don't tell the subject of the interview. We want them to come in. We don't want them to study up and to read up. We want them to bring those sort of fresh, unbiased ideas based on their own personal experience, based on their own opinions. And we tell them, speak for yourself. Now sometimes I want them, like if I'm interviewing students, for example, in a in a mock or a demo focus group, I'll say, so I love hearing what you had to say. Now, do you think your friends and your peers feel the same way or do you think they feel differently? Because, but normally in a focus group, I want that person just to speak for himself or herself. I don't want them trying to figure out what the rest of the world things because I'm going to do enough focus groups and talk to enough consumers I'm going to be able to figure out what's the pattern that I'm learning. So that's why focus groups. That's why focus group versus an IDI and how valuable it is to really get that really first-hand knowledge. Secondary research is what? Who knows what? Is it called secondary research? Okay. Who? I'll go with somebody back there because it's so easy to call when people are up here. Who knows, just can describe what secondary research is? Yeah, someone in the back row. Uh, secondary research is something that's been done by another company that's already kind of Thank you. That's a wonderful, brief, succinct uh, discussion and description because this is primary research is when you're really gathering from your target audience. And the secondary has already been done and it's valuable, extremely valuable, but you've got to talk to your customer. I did so much work over the years for the Johnson & Johnson family of companies and those uh, young men and women who were the product director or the group product director became presidents of the various operating companies. And they would so, if somebody skilled, they, they just trusted that I was going to ask the questions in an unbiased way. And they were very, they needed something overnight. And I would do sort of the quick and dirty uh, research and then I'd call in and say here's what I learned I mean it was that fast but you have to really be skilled and you have to be trusted and that came with a lot of years of work so I started with Procter & Gamble interestingly they never became a client when I became a consultant uh, for a lot of reasons they had their own resources in Cincinnati where they're based but Procter & Gamble gave me, I mean, I, I was, talk about, um, it was like getting a PhD, a, a master's degree, let's say. I learned on the job because I didn't have the advantage that you have of having IMC and being taught everything that I learned on the job. Now, I was lucky. I had a great teacher in Procter & Gamble. They were known as the gurus of consumer research. And when I left P&G and I was looking to join, to, to settle somewhere, and I ended up in Kansas City and working for NPI, all I had to do, they read my resume that I'd worked for Procter & Gamble and the doors just flew open. I had, I had no idea. I was still pretty naive in the business world. And you said, Procter & Gamble, that was like, uh, 
I, I don't even know what to say, but I didn't need to say much else other than I'd worked for Procter & Gamble. It didn't matter that my degree was in education and English, and, um, but I really learned my skill at Procter. Then with New Product Insights, I honed my skill as qualitative, and then I eventually moved to the marketing side. I was able to interpret the consumer research into marketing strategy. So when you put those two together, consumer research and then being able to translate it into marketing strategy or creative strategy for the advertising agency or for the package design people, it really is how those pieces work together. So everything you're learning in IMC works together in the real world. It's all a bundle and it all works together and you're able to learn it and get a degree in it. So over the years, um, I worked for a number of clients. Let me get into some of the case studies. So 1968, I didn't get married. I didn't teach English. I didn't stay in Mississippi. And I will admit, in 1968, it was not a great time to be in Mississippi. I left never to come back. Now, I'm really glad I'm back. It's a different world today, but in the 60s, it wasn't a place to be. So I joined Procter & Gamble, and I was assigned to a team that Pringles was in the works. Pringles was in process of being developed. Now, so you have to really go back in time in the 1960s. Pringles didn't exist. So what happened is, this is how ideas get developed. And then I'll tell you where the uh, narrative part of consumer research comes in. But in this, it's all worked together, the secondary research. So there was a place in Cincinnati, the world headquarters, where there were people doing nothing but looking at data, looking at categories to say, Let's find something that looks right for innovation. The main criteria were, had to be high volume, high profit, and high household penetration. So they weren't looking for a little niche business, but one of the things that came up is the snack category, and particularly just potato chips as part of the snack category. Even back in the 60s, Potato chips were a $1 billion industry. Now today, it's more than $2 billion industry, just potato chips alone. I'm not even talking about all salty snacks or all snacks. So these brilliant people who are just there looking at data and statistics, and they're looking and they say, wow, somebody honed in on potato chips and said, so Lay's was the, the national brand. There were regional brands, but this was the national brand. And the way it worked, they literally sliced fresh potatoes and they put them in big frying vats. And then they'd go through this kind of a process. They were packaged in cellophane bags and they were delivered in what's called a store door delivery. There were the person who drove the truck. Now, and this, this were all men at the time. So I, I'm not being gender, gender biased when I say, so the men who were driving the trucks had a territory. It was about 200 miles in radius. And they, the trucks would be loaded in, with cardboard boxes. And in it were the cellophane bags of potato chips. And they, because they, they were fragile. And that's how potato chips were historically developed. They were fragile and people loved them. They were a huge success. And so they were delivered. And so what had to happen, and but this is where those brilliant people who were just looking at the details, and they said, look what they've had to do. Frito-Lay has had to build plants all over the country because 
a truck can, the most it will go is 200 miles. They are not shipped. They're too fragile. And they always felt this is part of what people love about them, is they're crispy and they're tasty and, yeah, they're fragile. So we put them in these cellophane bags and we put them in cardboard boxes and we have to have these um, delivery trucks. So the bright minds at Proctor went to R&D. I mean, they went to the uh, new product arm who, and they created a study to go to R&D and say, we want a potato chip. It's got to look like a potato chip. It's got to taste like a potato chip. But it's got to be packaged in a way that it's not so fragile and the packaging is different. It can't be cellophane. It's got to be something different. So where they started, it's fascinating that where these ideas come from and then where they eventually take a company and a product. This is what the, the people in R&D first began. They, were, they had to start somewhere. And they began to look at if they, they put potato chips out on a table or in a platter, they saw the whole, the largest and whole potato chips look like that. And that's where they began. They began to look at this shape and they're thinking, you know, that's stackable. If we take, because we want it to look like a potato chip and what we mean is not the crumbs in the bottom, but we want it to look like this. So they began to work on a shape. So that's how they got into it. And then they began to look at packaging that would be sturdy, where these stackable chips, now they knew that they weren't going to be able to slice potatoes and fry them up. They had to make a batter. And they, it took a lot. Pringles was 10 years in development <coughs> before it was ever available to consumers, already packaged, branded, with all the key nomenclature on the canister, went through so much. And some of the early work I did, the qualitative work, uh, one, I, one uh, uh, was another type of qualitative, quantitative, narrative, uh, numerical, we would go into towns and would set up at, in a gymnasium in a high school and we'd go through the PTA and invite uh, the female head of the household to come to uh, an, uh, a study and they'd be given money for the PTA. And I'd have a table set up kind of like this. And so what I was doing in that particular case, I had this plain, white canister. So they had already come up with the canister shape. It had not been branded yet. It had not gone that far. But this was the most minute detail, but very important. So it was in the stackable container and it had a, 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 a pop top uh, pulled off and then the plastic resealable. And all I was to do is to say inside this canister, and I didn't say canister, inside, because you never suggest, you don't want to tell them what it is. You're, you want them to talk to you in their language. I just said, open this up. There's something inside. And if you would, take it out. And you're welcome to try it. So to a person, they were opening it, but they reached in. Nobody had figured out. They thought they would pour them in a dish or in a napkin or something. But it said they reached in and it was very sharp and everybody was cutting them themselves. Not today, that would never happen with all the legal stuff. You know, we just went out and got band-aids and <laughs> some alcohol and we fixed everybody up and then we shut down the table and just said, hey guys, you gotta go back to the drawing board. That's not gonna work. Guess what? People reach in to get those top ones. But it eventually, and a lot of this was uh, worked out through focus groups. They did both the narrative and the numerical. But Pringles, they wanted something, a brand that was whimsical, different. The word Pringle, the, where they got it eventually, it was the name of an avenue in Cincinnati. Somebody opened a telephone book and 
wait a minute, listen to this, because they'd already spent millions on it with branding agencies. It would come up with brands, nothing really resonated. So, but all of this was tested in focus groups, and then it was quantitatively tested numerically to make sure it really did. But the most important was just to see how people reacted and to see their faces and to see their body language. It was crucial to have potato chips because they wanted, even though these were made from a batter, they wanted, they put the visual, they called them potato chips. Now, when I tell you that Lay's, the lawsuits that came out, they tried to shut down Pringles and they took them to court and said, but these are not potato chips. And the judge said, well, show me a registered description of potato chips. There wasn't one. There was no trademark register description. Now you know they developed it and they went through the trademark process, but it was too late. By then, potato, these were called, what are these called, what do you call them? Anybody eat Pringles today? What do you call them? Pringles. What? Okay, but what if you say, okay, yeah, if you say, let's go out and get some, because you really, I, I bet you don't really call them potato chips, do you? You call them Pringles. I, <laughs> yes, but, you, but what's great is you're thinking, what do you think of them? You think of them as potato chips, but you say Pringles. So by the time Frito-Lay was taking them to court and trying to shut them down and say, but these are not potato chips, these are, it's a batter and it didn't matter. So you see what happened? They just got rid of the potato chips on the canister. They call them Pringles because that's what people call them. And the way they have stayed, now this is, I'll just get through this quickly because um, they, the way they stay really in the game and a big player in the game is now through variety. But the canister, has lasted through time immemorial, the brand Pringles, which is really, they created a whole new category. They revolutionized the category. And it just came with somebody looking at the secondary data, pinpointing an idea, and then R&D, and then with a combination of narrative and numerical, realizing that they really had a winner. And see, they keep innovating. Now, this is that little snack size and they're on every airplane, um, not just being sold in the store. I had a student in one of my classes who, who shared one of the coolest stories I've heard and said, well, he was on some kind of a mission, a uh, missionary trip in um, Bhutan. They're in a bus on a, a, a little dirt road winding down and they got stuck for hours while a herd of something was crossing. And by then they'd run out of all their food and all their water and they kept going and there was this little store in the middle of nowhere. And they go in and there's every variety of Pringles. <laughs> So I just said, oh my gosh, I just, I love these stories because that's how they, they stay. And, and the reason companies can stay at the top of their game is they keep talking to their customer. They keep finding out what is it you're missing. You're not going to get that by looking at statistics and by looking, even doing quantitative uh, numerical and sending out a massive survey to 1,000 people, 5,000 people. It's really when you get people in talking, just chatty, chatty, chatty conversation, and they're bouncing off each other. And how, where I, I can't guarantee you, but I can pretty much guess where that idea came from. There are people who would say, what I do, I take my kids and I'm, we're just gonna be out for the day, so I'll just put some of them in a baggy, a Ziploc bag, I'll pour some from the canister. Bingo, let's get a snack size canister. Because they say the problem is, you know, they're, they break up when I've got them in a, like a baggy. So this is where those kinds of ideas come from. 
Has anybody ever had a bunt cake? Does anybody know what that is? Oh, good. Is anybody still making those? But I'll tell you. <laughs> okay, good. No, but I, no, no. God bless her. Okay. <laughs> oh. It's a franchise, so they have like Memphis and like Oliver. Well, let me tell you, there was a time when bunt cake was not such a well-known style of cake. So Duncan Hines is owned by Procter & Gamble. So when I worked for Procter, I, I was part of a team and doing qualitative research, the narrative, to just see what can we learn from the customer? What else can we do? And what came up were women who said they loved to make a bunt cake and they had a bunt pan. Well, this was not nationwide. It was just somebody, you know, a grand, uh, maybe your grandmother was buying a bunt cake pan and making it so then they got the idea to make bunt cake mixes. And then that's where it started. And then they'd include a premium, like in the Duncan Hines cake mix, because there would first be a recipe on the side of the box, how to make a bunt cake, and a, a coupon to go buy a, a pan. If you didn't have one, you could go buy a pan. But then it became a whole industry. So love knowing that. But those, that's where idea come, they come out of a focus group. You just hear people talking about that. So moving to it, <laughs> so um, you remember when we thought babies were delivered by storks. You know, that was a, a fun story. Where you look, see the uh, stork has a cloth diaper. That was the original, that every, every home that had a baby had cloth diapers. So this again was, this is still a Procter & Gamble arena and those guys in the idea room, somebody spotted diapers and said every household in the US that has a baby or babies has diapers. And there's gotta be a better way than these cloth diapers. And they were looking at, uh, you had to, and I love, this is really an ad from back in the 50s. This is how mothers dressed. This was like father knows best and you know, mother dressed up to, she's got a diaper pin in her mouth and she's diapering her baby. And in every home there next to the, uh, in the baby's room or baby's area, there was a table where uh, the diaper was changed and there was a diaper pail. And in it was some kind of a chemical where after you dump the solid waste into the toilet, you put the dirty diaper into the pail. And you had to then hire a service, a diaper service, where, and you can see, this is a guy delivering sanitized, sterilized, white cloth diapers and picking up the pail with the dirty ones. So this became another idea, went to the R&D, and interestingly, the man who really came up with the disposable diaper, they didn't exist, a, a grandfather, and he was, he hated, he changed diapers, he changed uh, his grandchildren's diapers, and he hated them, and he said, I want this assignment, and he said, I wanted to develop something that fit, anatomically fit the baby instead of those cloth diapers that you had to just do your best with uh, pens, pins. So they set out to make something that had a, a, clo a, fab a cloth a fa a material that would be absorbent and then would have a plastic backing on it and would have elastic and would have the, the tabs on the side to fit the baby. So now their idea, all guys, and they were absolutely convinced that the whole marketing proposition would be about convenience, that mothers 
can't possibly like the mess and the bother of the cloth diapers. And this would be something to give her more time for herself and not less time doing all this dirty work. So there were various brands tested like Mother Ease. They say, oh, this has been developed by experts and, uh, but this is gonna give you much more time to do what you need to do. So I was part of a, a group of teams. We were sent around the country and a local market research company would set up in-home interviews with mothers who had at least one baby, could have more, but they were still diapering. And they would be told that, that this is a never Procter & Gamble. We were, in fact, I had to carry, my business card said I worked for Grand and Market Research. We were, I could never tell anybody except my family that I worked for Procter & Gamble. Everything was top secret, everything was confidential. They didn't want the word to get out because they were looking to create something so revolutionary and patented equipment that it would take years for any competitor to catch up. That's what they did in Pringles and that's what they wanted to do with the diapers. There was no other disposable diaper. So we, I would be assigned to my list of mothers and my addresses in my city and I'd go in and I would observe. First thing we did, and there's a name for that, where you, want, you observe your target audience in the process of whatever they're supposed to be doing. Does anybody know what that's called? How did you know that? I was in the account fan class. Okay. Was that Chris Barr? Uh, it was Oh, okay, okay. But anyway, yeah, that's, that's, we called it getting to know our customer. Now it's called ethnography, it's a pretty cool term. But what was crucial is we observed the mother and this is what we saw. If we hadn't been there and watched it, because you don't get that from a survey. You don't get that from a quantitative numerical questionnaire. You only get it by observing. And what we saw was this amazing bond between the mother and the baby. And just what she was saying, you know, how she was talking to the baby, we said, oh my gosh, you know, I don't think this is considered an inconvenience, you know. So we got enough uh, of this kind of observation and then talking to the mother and interviewing her that we, and it took a lot to convince the men back in the office, the R&D people, the marketing people, we said, this is not about convenience. This is not about giving mother more time, not making it easier, not get, getting rid of the mess. This is about love. And this is about bonding with the baby. And this is about that whole interaction. So no surprise, ta-da where the whole direction of the brand went. And this was the first disposable diaper in the world. And Pampers, so you can see and look at the baby. Look at the color, the soft pastel color. The name Pampers, it's about pampering. And you'll see there's nothing really on here about functionality. They even talk about the fact that it's not, that yes, they say in the commercials and they'll, they'll get into some product benefits like it wicks the moisture away from the baby so there's less rash, that you don't have diaper rash, the baby's not uncomfortable, but it's even in terms of the baby, the baby's dry. It's pampering, the little heart. And one very cool thing we learned in the focus groups when we were then starting to test, so the package design people would give us a lot of different graphics to show because we were starting to build the brand. We're starting to build what kind of package, what color should be on it, what kind of uh, visual. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Need on the truth. Um, so 
The brand people had hired some of the best portrait artists in the country to create these gorgeous uh, portraits of babies and babies and mothers. And then we had photographs of babies and babies and mothers. And we would show these because we're building, you see, the package. We're building the language and we're building what visual and what colors and everything. It was fascinating to watch. And again, this, does, this comes more from observing body language and, and how they were responding, not even so much the words, but they responded more to the actual photographs <coughs> than to these gorgeous portraits. Because to a person, the mother projected herself and her baby. It didn't matter. Yes, we had boys and girls and so forth and different ethnicities, but it didn't matter. That mother could project herself and her baby, no matter the age of the baby, the color of the skin, color of the hair. We just, it was phenomenal to watch how she was able to respond to photographs. And to this day, they use photographs. They don't use even beautiful drawings. They use photographs. But all of that came from focus groups and came from listening to the customer, observing the target audience. And, um, and then, again, staying in touch with the customer, they literally pampers can grow up with the baby. They have newborn, they have from like, uh, they have age in terms of months, they have weight, different diapers in terms of weight. They've got, uh, so they've got swaddlers they have for newborn. You're going to the swimming pool? You don't want to wear that, you don't want to put your baby in that diaper, do you? Don't you? You want splashers. Because everything was really designed to grow up with the baby and to keep up with the baby's activities. Starting to cruise around, crawl around, moving into training, pant, pant, training pants, uh, we have easy ups. And that's how they've stayed uh, relevant and they've stayed on top of the game. And even though the competitors have come out, but you see what they've done, they came out with Uggies and Loves, so the competitors when they began to follow, they followed suit. They, P and G had already done all the leg work, and they had shown that you really now they're price brands. So you get Walmart brand and you get store brand, and now mothers have come to trust that those generic brands are fine. Uh, but Pampers has kept loyalty by they have a. Um, Let's see, what's it called? It's a pack that go, anyway, mother's in the hospital having a baby. She gets a new baby package. And in it are diapers. Now, I'm sure in some places, Loves has negotiated a better deal or Huggies has, but at the beginning, it was all Pampers. And they have in their coupons, and they also have a way for you to sign up for their uh, baby care club and you get coupons so you can continue to buy Pampers and you're not spending any more than you would if you were buying the price brands, but that's how they've maintained loyalty. I'm just, I was just gonna cover, did anybody have a question or comment? I just was gonna show one other that really came from a focus group, yes. Um, when did you start working for Procter & Gamble? 1968, I started, I graduated in 68 and then that fall, I was supposed to get married August 9th. I didn't. So I started to work for Proctor in October of 68. My, my uh, best friend in high school, his great grandpa was one of the key people for Proctor and Gamble expanding. If you know who he is. Wait, Proctor and Gamble? Expanding. Yeah. Expanding. Oh, expanding. His, uh, his name is Nelson Brooks. He, he started the aviation line for Proctor and Gamble. What's the aviation line? Uh, like the aviation department, he, he 
drew up most of the routes that Procter Gamble's planes take to go to different countries? Oh, wow. I, we'd have to talk. I'd like uh, to know his well, name. Probably, probably got you, I texted my friend's mom and she told me all about it. So. Oh, really? Well, I'd like to know his name. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's great. I love to hear those stories. So anybody else have a question or a comment? Because I'll cover one more because this, I mean, this was so only in a focus group, but it's one of the greatest focus group stories. Uh, so this was back in the um, 80s. Now I'm trying to remember. I think it was the 80s. Yeah, I went to work for NPI. Yeah, okay. So it was in the 80s. And anyway, so try to imagine a world without Starbucks. Try to imagine a world without uh, High Spot and Cups and all these boutique, great little boutique coffee places. Hard to imagine because in the day, Folgers and Maxwell House were the two national brands, and if you wanted coffee, you bought it at the store, already ground. The only place that had beans and a grinder in the store was A&P, and that was 8 o'clock coffee. But these were the two national brands. If you wanted coffee when you were out driving and about, you go to the filling station. And when you're getting your gas, inside they've got a little single burner with a coffee pot and what? some sugar, and you just put a nickel or a dime in the cup, or you don't have to do anything, but you just get your cup of coffee. And that was really it. I know it's hard to imagine, but you know, try your best. So back in the early 80s, we had a client. I was with NPI at the time, and Bob Camersham and Lou Berry knew each other, and he was president of Dunkin' Donuts, and it's in Randolph, Massachusetts, very strong in the Northeast, but um, the but uh, national, but really strong in the Northeast. And this is what a Dunkin' Donuts uh, shop looked like. It was a place where you bought donuts and you bought sweet baked goods and things like that. So Cam hired us and said, look, our franchisees and our company stores are just looking for something new to put in the store instead of, you know, we've uh, donuts and bear claws and uh, coolers and stuff like that. And so I set up focus groups around the country. Now, because they were, they wanted to be national. They were, but we did go where Dunkin' Donuts at least had a store. And there's not one here, right? There's no Dunkin' Donuts here. Interesting. So, all I did, uh, all I did was say to the local market research company, I need people, and can, uh, men and women, and we, at that time, we, and it depends on the subject, we segregated male groups from female groups. And not for anything other than we just didn't want any bias at all. And we didn't want like, somebody to feel embarrassed to say why they went to this place and that place. It was just more of an instinct that said, you know, let's just separate the men and women, but we need um, a group of loyalists, people who go to Dunkin' Donuts, and then we need people who, when they're wanting that kind of thing, they go somewhere else. So it could have been just a bakery, or it could be the supermarket and the bakery. And, um, and then we'll have a group of mix, so we can kind of let them interact with each other. So in the first city I went to, and I walked into the men's group, so I didn't know that much about them. But these were loyalists to Dunkin' Donuts. And this is not my group, but I tell you, if I could have had a photograph from back then, it'd look very much like that. So I'm hanging out with the guys and um, talk about, again, they didn't know the subject was Dunkin' Donuts. We just said that when you buy things like, and we listed 
um, and it turned out, so we, we'd give them a multiple choice list and they, these were the people who picked Dunkin' Donuts as at least once a week, but it was where they went most often. So we're asking, you know, what do you buy? Why do you choose that? Why didn't you go someplace else? And what I was hearing, first of all, these guys who were the loyalists to Dunkin' Donuts turned out their professions were salesman, truck driver, construction worker. And they loved to go to Dunkin' Donuts for coffee. Now sometimes they buy a donut and sometimes they buy, they might pick up a bag to take home at the end of work. But the main reason they were going to Dunkin' Donuts was to get coffee. And they, could, they went throughout the day. That's how they ended up being such loyalists. They had time to go out to Dunkin' Donuts or to stop by a Dunkin' Donuts. They were buying coffee. And there was one point in the focus group, I said, excuse me, I have to step out for a moment. I went around to the back room. So Bob Camersham wasn't there, but uh, my colleagues and some from Dunkin' Donuts were there. And so they're observing through this, it's a, called a viewing mirror. It looks like a mirror on the side where the participants are, but it's a viewing glass on this side and it's soundproof so they can't hear anybody. And I said, coffee, did you know that? Has anybody looked at your sales at your stores to see how big the sales of coffee is? You know, they thought of themselves as a donut shop, as a bakery, as a sweet. But, but this, was, this was before people were like big into like data analytics really, I guess. It must have been because otherwise they would have seen that, right? I, I still think. How did they not see it? I mean, when you think about the guys at Procter & Gamble in 19, mid-60s were looking at data yeah. and they saw, oh, look at potato chips. Yeah. But I how, guess, how they missed. How they missed it, who knows? Yeah. We didn't press that. But all we did is, we didn't want somebody to get fired, but Lou Barry picked up the phone and called Bob Camersham and said, would you have somebody back at the office start looking at your data, the coffee sales in each of your stores? I think we got an interesting new idea. This is literally where the idea to really promote Dunkin' Donuts coffee came from. What's their slogan? What's the slogan? And if you think of Dunkin' Donuts, any advertising, what are they referring to? Coffee. Well, it's, I mean, this is one of the most amazing stories about how ideas come out of focus groups. This is the concept board. And I'm sorry I don't have a better, this is the concept board that came, that we, uh, had our graphic designer and the copywriter then develop different ways of talking about Dunkin' Donuts coffee because then we went back into focus groups to see and what this is. So you have to really imagine nobody, people were buying Folgers and Maxwell House and they're brewing it at home. And we found out that Dunkin' Donuts coffee was really so popular so what we did is we proposed, and the original bag was this brown paper bag that just said Dunkin' Donuts coffee by the pound. And it was all ground, because at that time people didn't have uh, coffee grinders at home. But it says you couldn't buy coffee this good, <coughs> excuse me, coffee this good before except by the cup. So we were promoting that you buy it by the pound and you take it home and brew it instead of Folgers or Maxwell House. Now amazingly, as it turns out, on the other side of our country in Seattle, this is the original Starbucks in downtown Seattle that was only selling coffee grinders. They weren't really, they were selling coffee, but that wasn't the main thing until Howard Schultz bought it. And he had been to Italy, and he had been to the coffee bars in Italy, and he saw how it was a lifestyle. And so here, Dunkin' Donuts began promoting their coffee and big focus, and big, big, big focus, and even in the, I, I love this particular shot of a shelf, 
you, Dunkin' Donuts overpowers Starbucks. I don't know if it's true in every grocery, but, but Howard Schultz bought it, bought Starbucks, and he turned it into a lifestyle. And he, he really was recreating what goes on in Italy, where they get a uh, cappuccino and they get, and they, they buy it by the cup and then they sit. Well, I shouldn't say that. My husband's Italian. Have I you learned ever, they charge gone, more if you sit. Huh? Have you ever gone to the original Starbucks? In no. Seattle. Anybody ever gone? Good really? Luck, good, luck, good, good luck getting in there. It's like three hour away. Oh, I can it's imagine. Like it's the same. It's like, yeah, it's a, it's a tourist attraction. Yeah. You do over a set of seven steps. And it's normal range. So. Oh, my gosh. That is, that's, a, that's so cool to, to hear about that. And then, of course, they keep growing with the trends in the marketplace. So of course, they have, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Ooh, the pollen in this area. I do like on my car, the pollen is unbelievable. So they also have the little um, coffee cups for the single brewing. And has anybody, whoops, let me go back. So they've even been copied. So there is a, a type or a brand, shall we say, that's sold in the little cups. It's got these colors, but it's called what? What? Yes, that's it. It's Donut Shop. There's two now. One's called Donut Shop, and the other's called Donut something. I just bought the other day. It's Walmart's brand. So Walmart is, is making their own brand to look like the Donut Shop that made their brand to look like Dutch Donuts. <laughs> So it's like a, a third-generation yeah. copycat of, of Donut. Crazy. Just, it, it's fascinating, but, but it... But that, isn't like Donut Shop owned by Keurig or somebody? Uh, could be, but I don't know, it, because Keurig. I thought, anyway, originally they were buying from like Green Mountain or they were yeah. buying, but, uh, but of course, and whoever... 95% of those things are made in Baton Rouge. Really? They, the, there's this company in Baton Rouge, this guy that moved from New York for some reason, that down to Baton Rouge and, and he packages like 95% of the pods that are distributed throughout the... Uh, oh, that is so cool. But this, I love this story because this literally came from a focus group. That's how it all began. And the rest they say is history. Anybody have <laughs> questions or comments or... Because we're going to... Wednesday, we're really going to hone in on focus groups and how you uh, recruit and how you write a discussion guideline and... So I, I think that this is good. Uh, we got still got about 10 minutes. Y'all chill out. That's so, right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, don't get, go yet. The, the three examples I think are really great for, for a couple of reasons. I think, you know, if you, if you think about the potato chips and the Pringles, what, what you see is an example of using research to build a new brand, but really a new product that, that, that was a brand uh, you know, they eventually kind of came out to be a brand. Uh, in the Pampers example, I think you see this example of, yeah, they were trying to build a new product, but really what they uh, were doing uh, in that example is that um, they had the product, they just didn't have a way to sell it. So the focus groups allowed them a way to sell something they, they had created. They didn't really know how to, how to go about packaging it. And I think in this third example with Dunkin' Donuts, you've got an example of, of an insight that never would have been realized except through uh, except for research. So just three, um, you know, not, not completely disparate, but three kind of unique examples of how you might use more narrative-based, interview-based, focus group, qualitative research to gather insight about what people are doing either presently with an existing product uh, or service um, or what they think about um, your existing or new product. Service. And if you guys aren't excited about this, then go somewhere else because this is awesome stuff. Um, this really is where where sort of research um, speaks to how we um, you know create things. Some 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 things people need, and sometimes sometimes we create things people don't necessarily need, but eventually they can't do without. You know, how many people go to someone's house and there isn't a curate? You know, um, we don't really need it. You know, we could make coffee otherwise. Before, before that, it was instant coffee, which is terrible, but that, that's what people did, right? They, they yeah, so if you wanted... Put it in, you know, you did the instant, and of course, that got a bad name, and so this, this is instant coffee. Uh, but it's brewed, you know, and that's the, that's yeah. the image. Yeah. But, here's but for the Italians, you don't have one of those things. 
Well, yeah. no, no, but wait a minute. You know what they came up with? Yeah. Nespresso. Nespresso. Yes. It's so it's the same people. thing, but espresso. Yeah. Yeah. But it's the fancy people. So. Yeah. yeah, it's the same, but to get espresso, you know, instead of another way. So, no, but here's a fun story. The guy who created Curry, and he started the whole trend of pods and the uh, single cup brew. He, and I, sh I should look this up, but I'll tell you, he, he's embarrassed and ashamed now because of how many of those are in landfills and people are not recycling them. And they, he feels, he feel, he's kind of apologized. For there are brands that create, um, that are like a, not reusable. reusable. There are reusable, but there's also compostable uh, ones that you can just compost. Or can, how many people have a compost pile? Yeah. One. But how many, I mean, I feel, I try, because we do have an espresso, and I, supposedly, William Sonoma was recycling those, right. and they gave me a bag, and I took them back and said, what do you want me to do with this? And I said, I thought you recycled them. <laughs> um, all right, so if you'll notice, um, there's a new folder uh, on Blackboard called Focus Group Materials or Stuff or something. Oh. Uh, there's one file in there now that gives you an outline of where we're going uh, for the rest of the semester. Basically, is going to be primarily focus group. We're, basically, we're going to divide the focus group uh, material into two primary units. So you've got a module on focus group that's divided into two units. The first unit, uh, Ms. Westbrook's going to be with us until April 11th, and we're talking all about how to do things like we did for circuits, how to sample, how to recruit, uh, how to get people into a room to talk, and then once you get them in the room, how you design your moderator guide and how you might moderate. So you're going to get practice in creating a screener, creating a moderator guide. Uh, you're going to see a mock focus group. Um, we're going to use that mock focus group to teach you how to take notes, <coughs> different strategies on note taking if you were to do a focus group. So you're going to turn in uh, a screener and a moderator guide for affordable housing, for what we've already been talking about. Right? So there's no change there. For the second half, which I'm just calling like gaining insight from focus groups, um, we are going to use, we're not going to do focus groups because it's too much in, in the semester. We, I tried to do it last semester and I drove myself insane and the students were all like, ah. So we're not going to do that. So we're going to use their, the focus group we did last semester. Um, there's two of them. There, it's another client, so we'll talk about what that is and, and what the purpose was. But I'll show you that moderator guide. And then you'll basically, prior to one of the classes, and you'll see this on the schedule, prior to one of the classes, you'll have listened to the focus group by yourself, taken the notes in the ways that we suggest you take notes, and come in and kind of we'll bounce ideas off each other in terms of what kind of insights you think are there in those focus groups. And then you'll turn in, um, at some point, sort of your project you know, 2.0, which is just a two-page insight document from from those focus groups along with you the notes that you took um, from those focus groups. So you'll learn the whole process. It's just not, we're just not going to do the whole process. It's kind of like surveys. We didn't do the survey because, again, it's just too much to do within the confines of the semester that we're trying to teach you multiple methods. So the focus groups, we're going to try to get you that insight piece so that when you go to your campaigns course uh, next semester, you'll have the experience of at least getting your hands dirty in some actual data and getting some insights, extracting some insights from some actual um, data focus groups. Um, at the end of the focus groups, we're going to have a guy come talk to us again about affordable housing. He's a sociologist. He does in-depth interviews. He's going to talk about his sampling strategy and his stuff on IEIs, or what you call semi-structured interviews, whatever you want to call them. Individual, usually 60 to 90 minute interviews with one, per, one other person. Who's going to talk about that? And then we'll very briefly cover things like content analysis and experiments. Very briefly, um, maybe a little bit of ethnography and observation um, for uh, the last couple of that's where we're going. You'll see that represented on that um, slightly updated um, syllabus, uh, last part of the syllabus, to tell you when your assignments are going to be due. Um, so I'll remind you about that again on Wednesday when we'll talk about what can focus groups answer, what they can't, how you're going to sample, how you recruit, uh, and we'll talk about screeners because you'll have a screener draft screener due on Friday. Uh, and I'll put up an assignment so you'll, you'll draft a screener, put a screener up uh, for Friday, and then we'll use that screener on Monday and we'll critique those screeners in class so that you can turn your actual screener into a great for the next week. So if you have questions, come talk to me. Either about your career project or focus group. Otherwise, I'll see you on.